I insist that we are still a very repressive financial system. Acrylic data actually expose the banking system. So either you are inefficient or you are greedy. None of them is acceptable. Hello everyone, welcome to Artsniti. I'm Shekhar Tomar. We are very excited to have Mr. Tamal Bandopadhyay with us today. Uh, he's a business journalist who has been tracking the banking and financial sector in India for the last two decades. He's currently the consulting editor at the Business Standard. He's also a very prolific author and he has written multiple books, the recent one being Roller Coaster and Affair with Banking. He has also received the Ramnath Goenka Award for Excellence in Journalism and also received the Tata Literacy Business Book Award for his last book, Pandemonium. We are very excited to have you here, Samal. Uh, welcome to Arthaniti. Thanks, thanks, Shekhar. Thanks for calling me. So my first question is, you have interviewed so many people over the last two decades. How does it feel for the roles to be reversed? No, I'm a bit scared, I would say. I mean, because uh, I don't know what tricks you'll play, but it's fine. I mean, it's all in the game. So let's do that. So as a person who has tracked the banking industry, I want to go back in history, which is also what you talk about in your recent book, which is The Roller Coaster. Uh, how far have we come? So we started with the problems where it was super difficult to open banking accounts to something like UPI. And now we have discussions about CBDC. No, it's, uh, it's of course, we have uh, come a long way. I mean, in terms of spread in banking, uh, look at what has PMJDY done. I think it's 48 crore new accounts have been opened. Um, over the past uh, seven, eight years, I would say, yes, uh, 2000s. Uh, so that's that's the spread of banking uh, because the branches are no more the only point. You have this bank mitras, you have the BCs, that banking correspondent, etc. So that uh, spread of banking is definitely, uh, definitely, it's much, much better than what it was, uh, say, a decade back. Uh, that's that's talking about the spread. In terms of the way banking is done also has been changed because now banking is essentially what you are having in your pocket. Bank is uh, on your mobile. Uh, so all the apps, etc. In, in terms of uh, technology, I think in particularly in the payment space, you spoke about UPI. India as the forefront in the world, nowhere in the world, including the developed markets, are as advanced as India when it comes to payments, uh, payments, that technology bit. So on that two accounts, uh, two counts, I, I think uh, we, are, we are doing pretty well. So we always hear in research that mm. financial inclusion is so important. Yeah. And so your book recalls about like how difficult it was to open a bank account. So from that perspective, how important it is to have access to these kind of, let's say, payment systems like UPI or just having a bank account? No, that's, it's changing. I'm saying it's, it's, it's changing because, uh, you know, the, even, uh, even the, the mobile penetration in India is pretty good compared to uh, most of the countries. And most of them are using now the Android phone. So as and when that penetration goes and the use of Android phones, you don't need iPhone, any other phone will do. Uh, people are accessing that. So that's that's a good part of the story. Uh, payment space, it's absolutely, it's a revolutionized, I think. So I know no country in the world can compete with India. But the other part of it is the, you know, what I call it technically deep tech. But using the data for actually assessing the customer behavior, um, your worth, whether you should be given loan or not. So particularly, I'm talking about the AI and ML. I mean, excuse my using technology and all. The deep, uh, there, there we are, I, I don't think we are doing as much as, as we should do. The payment space, yes. But the using the technology for other purposes, uh, which is not happening in India as yet. And other part of is this, as I started saying that we have done phenomenal in terms of PMJDY and spread of banking, banking inclusion. But still, it's a, Still, it's a repressive financial system. Still, it's not easy to get a um, get a bank loan. I mean, fine, you are, you want to open a deposit with a bank, um, they will embrace you at this point of time because uh, deposit growth is pretty bad. Uh, so they'll welcome you. But you try to get a credit. So if you have to think in terms of steps, mm. being able to open a deposit is probably like first or second step. And the next step are to integrate people to be able to use other financial products, which is not happening. Yes, particularly credit that I am. Particularly. 
So I want to touch upon this uh, using algorithms to give out loans. Yeah. If you have to compare, let's say, India to some of the advanced economies, uh, what would be the difference, according to you, that's creating this gap between the two sets of economies? Is it because our economy is informal, the people you touched upon? Uh, to some extent, yes, I would say. But uh, again, there is a bank, there is a bank. You will find that after the consolidation, number of public sector banks are far lower, I think 11 of them. And then there are new private banks, old private banks, and um, foreign banks. Now, is every is every bank technology savvy? Certainly not. I mean, there are banks, and there are banks, and there are banks which, even if they are not there, probably we would not miss them. So when I say that deep tech, uh, that particularly using AI and ML uh, to assess the behavior of your borrowers and even to assess whether they are credit worthiness. A few banks have been doing it, but not as much as they, do, at, at, at they should do, but many banks are not doing it. So it's also the way, you know, the way you think. I mean, um, in this, we are moving ahead, but still there is a, a wide path to be covered. Again, you are talking about like the credit you will find that they are flocking to the same geography. You will find in India, certain geographies are credit stubbed and certain geographies are actually banks are banks and non-banks are encouraging people to over leverage, over leverage themselves. You know, they are competing with each other and if you are worth of actually uh, getting 50,000 worth of loan, I am actually flooding you with, with 1 lakh or 2 lakhs and as a, and I am also paying the price, I am not being able to uh, get the, my money back. And this is my fault. So banks are in some format, what uh, Rakesh Mohan said two decades back or more than two decades back actually, lazy banking, <laughs> it still exists, it still exists. despite competition, etc. I think in some format, lazy bank still exists. And so for specifically these people, do you think uh, NBFCs or some other or are there some other institutions which can fill the gap? Or you think that won't be feasible? They are doing it, but again, NBF, some of the NBFCs are just sophisticated money lenders. You look at the kind of the spread they have. I mean, the... the I know, like <laughs> some of the uh, online ones, if you look at their spread, yeah. it's so, 30%. So, so, so interest is the charge. Uh, because what they exploit this, that for these people, access to money is more important, not the cost of money. So that's, that's that the exploitation come. And the other part is this, Reserve Bank of India's new norm, the large NBFCs are being treated almost on a par with banks. So the advantage of being an NBFC, that soft touch regulation, you are not on the RBI radar, you are not on the RBI radar, you can do evergreening, you know, you can do a lot of things. The so-called EOD end of day concept, like in the bank you have to, complete your accounts on that, that particular day itself. But NBFCs had been slightly different, both the accounting and the RBI supervision inspection, etc. But now regulator is, has changed his approach. He's changing his approach. Large NBFCs are being treated on a par with banks. Because now RBI sees the financial system as a whole. The banks, the NBFCs, and the linkages. So that way, I mean, NBFCs, you will not find again too many NBFCs are, you know, excited to uh, to be in that space. Having said that, there are a lot of uh, NBFCs driven by technology, they are trying to penetrate. And, but again, I don't know how many of them will actually survive because it's a sort of me too product. But each of them in a private conversation, they said that they're unique and they're getting there. When it comes to uh, charging, Pretty high charge, so the exploitation still remain. So I don't, I'm not taking back my word that still we are a repressive financial system. So what would be exploitation? Like above what percentage do you think? Like, can we compare them to the traditional money lenders? No, you can't. I mean, definitely they are, they are cheaper than money lender. But they, 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 when you're using technology, why should you? Because your, your uh, intermediation cost has come down dramatically using technology. You know? So why should you charge that much? Why do? Why should you enjoy that kind of spread? We need to ask them. And so either you are inefficient or you are greedy. So neither of them is acceptable. 
and you don't think there might be cost for making out these loans still because you don't have the kind of information that is there in the formal sector no that's what i'm saying you, if you use ai and ml the deep tech the so called deep tech then uh, then then the problem will be solved to a large extent you know there are ways of doing it i mean do you go for capex or do you go for opex there are multiple ways of doing it and all uh, here there is no capex where there is no branch right so essentially you are spending on technology so if you have your technology in place then why the hell you charge so much when you can't claim that i am based on technology and charge 24% 26% 20 30% it, these things don't gel together and so coming again to the initial question that i started with so the next step is probably cbdcs uh, where do you think it's going to impact i guess it's still not on the credit side of things or you think it's going to impact there as well i think it's a very sensitive subject and um, i will be I'll, people will not like it to me saying this but it's at this point it's more like optics because cbdc we are positioning we were positioning it as sort of uh, to 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 i would say to contain the crypto craze even though completely two different things altogether i mean you, you need know? crypto because you don't want yeah. government to look at you <laughs> yeah. and cbdc is government yeah. no, and cbdc is a payment space yes. and crypto is nothing is neither an asset nor a currency it's basically uh, it's a gambling right there is no underlying asset whatsoever in crypto but there was a crypto craze 2 years back and um, globally uh, in india also for that so there was a concerted effort globally to create an optics and i think cbdc is that uh, to start with uh, for commoners those who are not exactly clued to this they feel like this way crypto versus cbdc which is not the case at all but at this point of time i think uh, we have some experiment uh, you know kind of uh, reserve bank of india done both health, wholesale space and started in the retail space etc etc but i think uh, i think there are a lot of many questions need to be asked because uh, here you will not get any any interest so why would you not keep money with bank deposits why you why you follow this and then also globally if you see there are cbdcs which are sort of international four or five countries uh, joining hands together and come uh, and looking for a common cbdc so all kind of experiments are happening but if you expect that cbdc will be here tomorrow and all of us will uh, will have that i i would think it it would take time and upi is doing fine with me i mean uh, all the payments we are do, we are doing you and me we are doing through our uh, through our uh, um, mobile phone now how would cbdc be very different from there what extra we would get from cbdc so those are the questions we need to ask but at this point of time i think it's more an optic and the purpose is served because crypto is sort of you know going so we'll go to the credit side of the story yep. and this is your last book which uh, won the tata tata business award yeah. pandemonium so yeah. over there you were tracking the history of the non performing asset crisis in the banking industry in india and you said that the second largest population so now we are the yes. largest population the banking yeah. se- sector has become the poster child for non performance so maybe if you can take us through this banking crisis and talk about the genesis and then we can continue discussion on that uh, you know, there are multiple reasons you know very difficult because what happened in the 90s we we got rid of the development financial institutions the icici first ifci was the oldest one idbi icici so if you can tell us the role of these development financial yeah. institutions yeah so the development financial institution were actually the the basically for uh, industrial credit that was the that was their role because banks were not into that banks were more into working capital financing and anybody want to get into industry large scale investment this is the development financial financial institute infrastructure so this would be infrastructure which yes. has a very long gestation yes. period yes 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 long gestation period and all and they were supported also to some extent by special window from the government the money is to come but then at some point of time i think uh, i think dr rangarajan when the mid 90s i think the wall between the banks and and the development financial institutions were pulled down when we embraced in post liberalization the 
the deregulation, the credit deposits, everything got um, you know deregulated and all. So that was the time. Uh, slowly, uh, the development financial institutions, who were actually the bulwark of, I mean, basically financing infrastructure and all the projects, uh, they got receded into the uh, backyard. The banks came in. And banks did not have the wherewithal, actually, the credit appraisal and other thing. Apart from the liability, we always talk about this, that, you know, the average maturity of deposits is far lower than the 15 and 20 year loans. Then how do you do it? So banks were pretty poor on that. Um, that's the, the first part of it. And then so we, they are bad at both. At credit appraisal, credit appraisal and uh, risk management underwriting that was poor and at the same time the asset liability mismatch on the on the on the deposits the average maturity deposits of lower than 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 the than the average credit side so what is the answer to that one answer is the takeout financing which is globally accepted meaning what is a 20 year loan you take it for the first 3 years then somebody comes take the next 3 years then somebody comes take the next 3 years in stages etc which in india never took off other, which is if you see the in the globally, uh, particularly in the developed markets, the source of money for project financing is the market, bond market. But in India, again, uh, the bond market, corporate bond market, has not developed as we speak. I mean, there's a tremendous. Uh, tremendous, uh, I would say, efforts have gone in, but still the bond market is not as vibrant and as deep as we. Want. Of course, uh, government borrowing, you know that the market is, uh, every successive year we are, we are going for higher and higher things and banking sector is, uh, is lapping up. As we speak, the 10-year bond deal has come down, banks don't mind. We'll, again, we'll see through um, the current year's highest ever government borrowing program. But if you look at the bond market, corporate bond market, it has not developed the way it should have been. So when you do not have a developed a vibrant and deep bond market when you do not have that kind of other instrument like uh, takeout financing etc then the entire onus is on banking that was the kind of situation say early this decade and then between say 2007 8 and just to till the Lehman crisis we found this three four years I would say is a golden period for Indian economy and banking because what we did, what we saw at that point of time is low inflation, Dr. Eddie regime I'm talking about. Low inflation, high credit growth, and high GDP growth. I mean, our economy grew around 9% odd for three successive years. Now, typically, three times the GDP uh, growth is the credit growth. That's the accepted. We even exceeded three times GDP growth, I think, one particular year. So there's a banks were over exuberant and all. And then Lehman came. And then to... To contain the Lehman crisis, the spillover effect, the entire world was flooded. But our reaction by the time Subarao came in, Subarao got into Reserve Bank of India just a week ahead before Lehman. And then like many other market, a similar thing happened during COVID also, you flood the system with money. You flood the system with money. That was the way to contain the problem. And then what happened in this early 2010, 2011, banks are flooded with money. Uh, government was pushing hugely into inf to infrastructure financing. So banks were little indiscriminate in giving money. Banks also, as I said, apart from their inability to appreciate the proper kind of risk management and underwriting, they also have the hard mentality. So if I may reiterate, so you are saying the early phase of UPA1, which is before the uh, 2008 Lehman crisis, they were already giving a lot of credit. Yes. Uh, on an average, yes. it was more than three times the growth of GDP. You are saying they went even more overboard yes. after Lehman. free money came in. Yeah, yeah. But having said that, I would not blame Dr. Reddy for being lenient. Actually, he sensed that something is coming up. So he started actually raising the risk weightage, if you remember. Uh, he was appreciated for that. On, on multiple areas, he, he raised the risk weightage. Uh, uh, essentially, banks needed to have more capital to lend. So that's how he could, he actually, to a large extent, he contributed how India, um, you know, the, the impact of Lehman was not as severe as some of the other countries um, um, suffered. Uh, Dr. Reddy's contribution was that. So I would not blame that particular phase, uh, so the seeds. 
But I would say the post Lehman, primarily what happened when the system was flooded with liquidity, the second phase of UP I'm talking about. The focus is on, on infrastructure. But at the same time, you do not have the logistic because land acquisition was a problem. Supreme Court was coming in in multiple places and all. And the banks were giving money indiscriminately. And I'm mean, coming to that, what I, I stopped saying that, the banks had hard mentality. When I say hard mentality is, apart from your inability to, to appreciate risk management and underwrite, credit underwriting, you also follow the leader. Like State Bank of India is going there, giving money. So irrespective of my size, I could be tenth of one tenth of State Bank of India. I also give money. My risk appetite is different. But so what? SBI caps has appraised the, uh, appraised the proposal and SBI has given the money. I should be there in the consortium because India is you no know, consortium land bonding and all. So it was a deadly cocktail. You know, it was a deadly cocktail. The in inefficiency of the banking system, the hard mentality, the ecosystem was not friendly. So banks were sandwiched between them and then add to that, you know, as a little bit of butter and cheese, their inefficiency and other things and all. And that's what happened. And corporate India took advantage of that. When Raghuram Rajan came post... Uh, so just to reiterate on this part, so you're saying you're getting loans for infrastructure which are blocked by either land acquisition or by Supreme Court or some environmental yes. law. Yes. And so the projects are not going ahead, but they are still getting financing. Yes, that's And right. all sorts of banks are giving the loan, although they might not have the appetite, same as... Absolutely, risk capital is different. Yeah. That, that was the kind of, as I said, the deadly cocktail and the government pressure on infrastructure financing. That, that, that was the kind of situation. And corporate India took advantage of that, at least some of them. And the first thing Raghuram Rajan found out is this. Look, what the hell is happening? Typically, a project, you have your own money, that's your, your equity, and then you have debt. So if you have to track in terms of time, yeah. I guess Subara was towards the end of his tenure, and then yeah. Rajan came in. Yeah. Does Subara have an inkling about uh, these things that are going on? Um, Subara came just ahead of the Lehman crisis. The first few years, uh, he he had to, you know, they flooded the system with money, etc., etc. He was little lax. I mean, I would say he was slow in, in tightening the that he himself admitted, you know, he, he should have actually uh, started tightening a little ahead, but he did that. And then by the time, the government pressure also there, uh, that you have to cut rates, etc., etc. When he started tightening, uh, if you remember uh, the Subaru's last policy, despite the uh, pressure from government, Chidambaram was the, uh, was the finance minister there, Subaru refused to uh, cut rates and uh, on television channel in the evening, uh, Ranga, a, a very disappointed uh, Chidambaram said, on the growth path, I have to walk alone. And Subarao answered it in his book. Subarao's book spoke about that, that why uh, he could not cut and all. So Subarao regime ended and Rajan came again with a crisis, the taper tantrum happening. Rupee was going down every day. So the Rajan's first job was to protect the rupee. You know, and he opened the new schemes, uh, NRI's money, etc. Et he settled down. And then he started looking at the banking system. And the first thing he found, what I was telling you is this, what's happening? Like any project, you need to have your equity on the table and then the debt comes. Depending on the nature of the project, debt to equity ratio, depends. one is to one, one is to two, one is to three, one is to four, one is to five, depending on what you are. But Rajan found, some of the corporations... If you can also tell us why is this ratio so important? This is important that your ability to pay back, you know, the nature of the, the, nature of the business, the cash flow, etc., etc., and your ability to pay back. So that's how you need to bring your own money. Uh, to, to put it uh, in, in, a, in a, using the cliche, you have to have a skin in the game. But what was happening, Rajan found out, is this, that... Corporate India, not the entire corporate, some of the corporations were not using their money at all. They are using bank money as debt as well as equity in some format, okay? Apart from fund diversions and other things and all. So Raghuram Rajan first sensed that there's something is wrong. What's happening? There's no debt on the table. It's only banks taking the, which means from A to Z, it's the bank's responsibility to see the project through. 
You don't have any skin in the game, but you were the promoter. That's where Subarao, in 2014, I think he did that Krillik, he as a database Reserve Bank of India put in place, where every bank, every lender has to tell us that what is the state of affairs, which, which uh, entity is giving back the money and which entity is not giving back the money. So this is basically pan bank information bank where you can see who is giving loan to whom so that everyone has a visualization over the entire exposure yes. of a given... Yes, acrylic, acrylic data. RBI, RBI created that. Nobody has access. Like even rating agencies, even now as we speak, rating agencies do not have the access to data. But Reserve Bank of India found that what's happening and what's happening is very, very interesting. How the banks are managing, I would say managing quote unquote, the so-called evergreening because banks have a vested interest not to allow a loan to go bad. Now, how a loan goes bad, let me explain very way. I am a lender, you are a borrower. So every 30 days you have to pay me. If you don't pay in 30 days, then you become a stress access. You don't pay in 60 days, then you become more stress. It's called uh, special mentioned account SMA1. You don't pay in 90 days, you become special mention account 2. And cross 90 days, then I have to tell, tag you as a non-performing assets or NPA. And I, I have to provide for it. Now, why do I camouflage? Because I don't want to provide for it. I don't need to set aside money for it. Because if I set aside money, then my profitability will be impacted and my capital will be eroded. So that's the root of the case. We are, I was, uh, banks were not, did not have the adequate capital to fight this out. So they were actually in a denial mode. They were actually in a denial mode, which Krillik exposed them. So how did they do this denial? That they found, they found what, what happened is bank A, bank B, bank C, you are a borrower of mine. You, you, what Reserve Bank of India click found out is this. So let's see a consortium lending, right? A consortium lending, suppose X amount, 100 rupees is being lent by five banks to one particular entity. Now, all the five banks are not lending you on the same day. They were different days, like a different month. So which means that 90 day for bank A is different than bank B. Bank B is different than bank C. And bank C is different than bank D. What was happening is some of the corporations with the connivance of the banks, they were using this arbitraging so that I will give you the money to the bank. You make sure that it doesn't go beyond 90 days. And then the money exits, gets into bank B. Again, there the 90 days norm has been here. And then gets into bank C, there are the 90 days. So that's the way of hoodwinking the system. And banks were consciously doing it. Why they were doing it? Because they did not want to provide for it. Why they did not want to provide for it? They did not have enough capital and their profitability will be impacted. And as you know, even though the, the government-run banks are majority owned by governments, but there are investors, like between 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%, 45% outside investors. So you need to also face the investors after, after every quarter. And would you like to say that my NPA has gone high so much, I, need to, I have to provide it for so much, my capital has been eroded, then you'll be killed on the market, no? So there are multiple reasons and all. So, Skrillic data actually expose the banking system. And what I say, in a very, I mean, if I'm permitted to say, was that, uh, so banks were doing uh, belly dancing. People knew that. People are imagining beyond that what is there. I mean, if you have been in a strip bar. And then RBI actually forced them to strip. Nothing to, now nothing to hide, no more. No, no light and shade, nothing can hide you. You are just stripped naked. Krillic's stripped the banks naked, most of the banks. And RBI, Rajan, then there was a... So this is 2014 we are talking about. Yeah, no, 2014, it started 2015. It, it, uh, 2014, Krillic was in place. And by 2015, uh, uh, Rajan found that this was happening. Then there was a long discussion with banks. Look, we have to do this, something, something. Now the banks were, of course, reluctant because the, where is the capital? And you remember, um, finance minister uh, at that point of time, uh, he announced the biggest ever, I think, two trillion plus recapitalization. 
So my understanding is this, I have written also in my book, uh, the Reserve Bank of India team led by Rajan, I think Mundra also was there, they met the finance minister, they explained to him that we need to, we need to act on it, there is no, there's no point. And they convinced the finance minister, Arun Jetli was there, uh, the late uh, Arun Jetli finance minister. So he made that historic announcement of 2 trillion plus, I think, recapitalization, so banks were reassured. And we got into the first of its kind cleaning up action, it's called AQR, Asset Quality Review. It started from December quarter of 2015 and it ended on March quarter of 2017. So six quarters, banks were given to come up clean. So banks started cleaning up and the government started pumping in money that uh, recapitalization, uh, two trillion plus, etc. So actually it even spilled over. If you see that by that time, from a reasonably healthy, apparently reasonably healthy uh, NPA thing. By, by 2018, 2017, March it ended, but it got over. The banking system accumulated 10% plus gross NPA, which is, I think, the second highest among the G20 nations after Russia were there. Some of the banks, like, I think, uh, IOB, one of them I remember, one-fourth of, uh, of the total assets. I guess the public sector banks had much higher level of yes, uh, yes, of course, public than the average. Banks, yeah, some of the private banks too, which have exposure to corporate India, so they misread. They thought you know uh, in 2014-15 they thought no, it's a corporate loan is pretty good and all. So like ICICI also had, Axis also has, uh, not as much as the public sector banks, but among the new private banks, as these two banks also because their exposure to corporate India was pretty high. Uh, but public sector banks, as I said, a few banks, um, IOB, offhand I can remember, 25% plus NPAs. So that was the phase of, uh, that's the worst phase. And what Rajan actually started, his successor, Urjit Patel, uh, took it to a logical end. Whatever the, so, and then by that time also, you know, in record time, Pranam Mukherjee by that time was the finance minister, we got IBC. Uh, the so this is going back to 20... 2016, August, if I'm not mistaken. In a record time, globally, nowhere in the world, you get your insolvency code in such a fast pace. So all these things, like the acrylic, then following that, uh, the AQR, Asset Quality Review, uh, then uh, exposing the banks to the problem, uh, convincing the government the problem and convincing the government uh, to get in, uh, to announce 2 trillion plus recap, IBC coming, all these things, you know, are the positives that contributed to the turnaround of the Indian banking system. But this is still the recognition phase. They recognize that there is a problem, yes. they recapitalized. Yes. And then how did they turn it around then? No, so what happened is around the same time, uh, also the fear of that C, three Cs, the CBI, CVC and all, that's also uh, started playing out on the bank's mind. There are over aggressive, uh, you know, investigative agencies. So banks were picked up and thrown into jail. So all those things, there's a fear psychosis created. Now, it impacted two ways. One way is this, banks uh, almost stopped lending. If you look at 2018, 19, 20, even before COVID coming, uh, our, there's a dramatic drop in the lending thing because banks became, you know, there's a fear psychosis gripped the banking system. That's the, that's the one side of the story. Other side of it is that the banks started soul searching, recognizing their issues and addressing their problem, like the herd mentality we are talking about, etc. They started uh, going for better risk management, better underwriting. So on the one hand, they said, look, we have nothing to lose. So let's, let's expose ourselves. Let's clean up the system because government is giving the money. Second is, let's put our house in order. So these are both still the supply side of it. And I guess it's difficult to quantify hmm. whether they were really assessing the risk well or whether there was really this fear psychosis that they didn't want to lend anymore. It's a combination of both. It's a combination of both. And do you think the demand also played a role? Because the corporates which had easy money going for 10 years, now suddenly they also had to work hard to show that these projects are viable and maybe some of them were not viable and they were not asking for the loans anymore. 
Now, two, three things happened which I missed out. One is this corporate India became aware that they, they own, would not be able to take the banking system for granted anymore because that democracy sword IBC was there. You know, the fear of losing your empire. Because banks started exercising IBC under Urjit Patel's. The first 12 accounts were identified, then more accounts, trillions of rupees. The banks started taking them to court. Of course, corporate, there are, there, I, I, I do not like to name them. They were going to different high courts and trying to delay the process, etc., etc. But at the end of the day, more than the IBC as an instrument, the fear, fear of losing your empire also made the corporate India more circumspect. They also knew that would not be able to take the banking system for granted, which historically they have done. Taking money from a group company, then another group company, then the fund diversion, and all those kind of things and all. They, more than the IBC as a system, uh, that infrastructure, the fear of losing. So banks actually using IBC uh, to, to create a fear psychosis among their borrowers. So the borrowers who were actually, you know, uh, uh, they, are, they, they are bank defaulters, but their lifestyle was never changed. Uh, their Mercedes um, class never changed everything. And they would never come. But now it started happening that for the fear of being dragged to court and losing borrowers started coming to banks also. So what I see, what we see now through IBC, how much money is recovered. If you do a research, how much money is recovered outside IBC through just settlement process. It will be quite a substantial amount. So all these things, I think between 2000... Ah, so you don't even have to go to IBC. They are yeah. willing to settle even before yes. that. Yes, yes. So between 2016 and, and 20, I would say that three, four years, uh, just before the COVID hit us, uh, uh, Indian banking system, actually the metamorphosis happened, both from the supply side and the demand side. Now again, going back to where we started, the Development Finance Institute. Yeah. We know that this cleanup is happening, but we know this entire mess started because we wanted to fund infrastructure. Yes. And India is still a growing economy and we don't have Development Finance Institutes even now. Yes. So what's the way to get around that? No, we have one, say IIFCL was there, it's not been working, but NAFED, uh, the NAFED is already working. It's headquarters in, uh, BK. I think it's still looking for a headquarter. I think it's is operating from Sidby office. Ex-Union Bank of India chairman, uh, MD, is now heading NAFED. Uh, Mr. Kamath is the chairman of NAFED. And he has already, if I'm not mistaken, he has already started uh, lending money already. So, and NAFED is also raising money from the market. But will NAFED be able to meet the entire infrastructure demand? Certainly not. But... As a substitute for DFI is the so-called Development Financial Institutions. NAFED is there and NAFED is slowly getting into act. IFCL is not, I mean, has not done much, etc. Other part is, of course, we need to develop the bond market in a big way. Uh, so because banks traditionally, historically, uh, and nowhere in the world banks take the responsibility of, uh, of, of lending to infrastructure in this way. And as I said, takeout financing has not developed. So we need to uh, we, we need to wait and watch how NAFED grows uh, its balance sheet and how to what extent it can supply money. At the same time, you also need to see um, how to deepen uh, the debt market. These are the two things I think way forward. And if you look at the um, balance sheet of the banks in the past, say post AQR in the past five, six years, you see the dramatic shift from corporate loan to retail loan, including India's largest lender, State Bank of India. It has more retail than corporate. And look at any bank, like IDBI, you probably three-fourths would be probably retail. So which is unthink of, unthinkable. I mean, India's public sector bank into retail, and that's also uh, uh, my fear comes is this, other credit underwriting and the risk management is. And this is again it. maybe fear psychosis working and diverting credit to the retail side. No demand is there, and fear psychosis. I think I think it's now they have got over this okay. because government also. I mean the investigative agencies uh, realize that, uh, and there are multiple meetings where finance minister along with the chiefs of investigative agencies met the bankers and 
and tell them to work with without favor and fear, nothing would be done. And I think as we speak, uh, that fear psychosis is no more there. Uh, there was credit demand was not there, but then there was a dramatic uh, post COVID in 2013, uh, 2023, fiscal year 2023, we see that there's a decadal high up credit uptake. It happened. It continues. So, discussing about this crisis, we kept hearing names hmm. about the governors at the Reserve Bank of India. And I guess we all like to praise heroes and we want to see heroes in some of the key personals which head important institutions. And since you have talked to most of these governors and also tracked the RBI so closely, how important do you think is the personality of the person at the helm? Definitely. Definitely. Uh, as far as, I mean, that's true about banking also. If you see globally, uh, Jimmy Diamond or anybody. Say so banking is one because you deal with money. I mean, you don't care who is the FMCG chief or say um, some company, cement company or, um, or anybody else, a manufacturing sector. Uh, who is the boss you don't really mind but banker who you mind because the, the entity deals with money right uh, how the banks are different from any other companies you see coal mines on auction you see telecom spectrum on auction highest bidder get it but in banking you set the rules how much money needs to one bring in so it's not this is not a highest bidder but the most credible bidder of course, despite that, um, RBI has gone wrong on certain, certain, account, certain accounts. But it's the fit and proper that's important because you are dealing with money. And this is a global case. So globally, you will find the bankers are, the banks are known by the banker who is running it. And so is India in most of the cases. It's no, not we a, know. They it's are, not of a, course, the yeah, face. It's not a faceless uh, institution, which could be in a manufacturing sector or an FMCG. And... Definitely in Reserve Bank of India, it's the same thing. Central banking, yes, there are rules and procedures, but who is at the helm? Who is the RBI governor? That's that's very critical. I mean, how do you... Because, uh, you know, it's, it's essentially, as a governor, the government expects you to do certain things. Uh, whether you... How do you do it? Would you brush aside? There are governor I will not name. Uh, you would not meet a single government person. You would not take a call from any secretary. Any of the secretaries. You can name the governor. There's a, there's a, <laughs> there's a governor. <laughs> and there is a governor who would meet everybody, but who would decide what is to be done. Let's, let's talk about the current governor. Uh, current governor, uh, Mr. Das. He's not an economist. He's a student of history, etc. Now you see, when he came in, there's a tremendous pressure that RBI should pass on bigger amount of money from his balance sheet to the government to help the government bridge the fiscal deficit. Now, what did he do? He constituted a committee uh, headed by Bimal Jalan. And the committee came out with the report. Indeed, money was given, more money was given to government, but not as much money as the government wanted. Similarly, on crypto also, there were uh, you know, all-round noise. Um, the government was keeping silent. But in 2019, there was a committee uh, where SEBI chair, uh, chairman and RBI, deputy governor, etc. there. It was anti-crypto. But government was keeping quiet on it. Did RBI allow the crypto to happen? This governor went all out and said that, no, I mean, we will not allow this crypto and all that. But he has done it in such a way keeping everybody in the loop through discussion and other things and all. But there will be govern there are governors, there were governors also. They would not believe this kind of discussions. I am not questioning the person's integrity, extremely high integrity, extremely high knowledge, extremely high on governance. But basically the the maze of you know, how, to, how do you walk through this? That's very important. Like, say, YB Reddy, one bureaucrat told me, we used to treat him like a gunda. He was a gunda. But we had to relent to him because here is a gunda who is a well-meaning gunda. Right? <laughs> so even if, you're, even if you're a gunda, if you're a well-meaning gunda, then they will get convinced. 
Let me put it other way. Again, I'm bringing uh, YB Reddy in the picture. Uh, there was a uh, book launch written by YB Reddy and another gentleman here in Mumbai. And current governor, uh, Sakti Kanta Das was sitting and he was a chief guest there and he, he was sitting in the front row. And we were talking about the different governors and how they approach, etc. Now, Dr. Reddy said, um, not in the context of governor, you said that there are people, you know, um, you want something from him and that person gives you, but you come out from his room, not a very happy person. He has given it, but probably has given it grudgingly and all. And there are, in, there are personalities, he will say no to you. And then he was looking at uh, <laughs> Sakti Kanta Das sitting on the front row there, <laughs> pointing out to him, he said, there are personalities who'd say no to you, but you come out from his room with smile. So you, how you, you know, at the end of the day, even if you are a governor, you are the country's chief money man, but if you only focus on money and money multiplier and M3, and you don't uh, take care of the ecosystem, which involves the bankers, which involves the industrialists, and most importantly, which involves the government, then it becomes a difficult. So some governors have been able to do that well, some governors have not been able to do that well. Again, coming back to, uh, say, one governor, um, Subarao. When Subarao came, uh, at the end, in the, in the beginning, he was basically not asserting himself. But, but after a few years, he started asserting himself. He started saying, no, sorry, we can't do that. And which is why uh, Chidambaram had to say that I have to walk on the growth path alone. And Subarao answered that. So some governors take time to realize and start asserting themselves. Some governors start asserting from day one. Uh, but at the end of the day, as I said, uh, that ecosystem, how do you take care of? Like Dr. Jalan was more a diplomat than a governor. I mean, you would make sure that uh, you are happy. I've given an example again in, the, in my book. Uh, there was a huge... Uh, um, unrest among the bank employees and there was um, there was a bank strike called and I I, I, was a, I I watched that from a close quarter how he managed that strike he called the um, then the supremo of the bank union uh, who could uh, like uh, million plus bank employees will just pen down strike will go for one call came uh, for a discussion and he offered tea etc etc and then he was asked to uh, uh, sign a statement or see that thing and the statement says that governor has a constructive discussion with the with the uh, uh, bank trade unions and um, discussed it I mean and governor promised to look into the issues and the trade union is not going ahead with the strike I mean that was the kind of I'm paraphrasing it the gentleman having a cup of tea and saying that even the discussion has not started and how could we say that too but <laughs> Dr. Jalan <laughs> made him understand look I have to I have to say that I, I look into it and you have to withdraw. Otherwise, if I don't look into it, then how do you withdraw? So that's it. And people people would forget about it. So that's how he's managing. It's a, it's a great diplomacy. So the point I'm making is this in a country it is a bank of in a country like India, the central banking job is you are beyond a money manager. Yes, you are an independent agency, RBI is independent. Like Dr. Reddy used to say that, I am I have been, I am as, in, I, I think he said, I have been told by the government to say that I am independent or some such thing he said that. So that's the kind of independence, uh, you know. But there are certain sections which the, which the government can invoke and go against you, which uh, Dr. Ujit Patel faced. On certain, on certain issues. Uh, so you need to also be a diplomat, you call yourself a diplomat, you call yourself a politician, whatever it is. Manager. Beyond, beyond uh, money manager, you need to be a great money manager. But at the same time, you need to also manage the ecosystem well. So just to delve on this further, I'm just doing this thought experiment. If you put one governor in a different situation, yep. So let's say we start with Rajan. Mm. If he was supposed to do demonetization, how would that go? 
Uh, you asked me in the beginning that uh, I'm sitting on the other side. How does it feel now? You now I'm t- t- I'm tasting it. Uh, I think Rajan would not. Uh, you know, he would have probably resigned because Rajan's uh, opposition to demonetization is in the public domain. Uh, the the talk about demonetization started during the Rajan time. Uh, if you remember, Rajan did not get an extension or. Let's say he did not want to have an extension, whatever it is. But much before his term came to an end, he officially announced that he would step down. So this is one example where you think that the individual really stands out, even though there might be the entire incentive structure, regulations and all. I would like to say that it's one way of looking at it. Rajan would not have done it quit. Or the other way of saying it is this. Had he not done it, he would have to go. And so someone I mean, else would do it. It's, it's the <laughs> okay. two sides of the same coin. I mean, it's the it's open to interpretation. So let me ask another one. If Subara was asked to give higher dividends to the govern, government, would he have done that? Or how would he have handled the situation relative to, let's say, Urijit Patel? It's difficult to say. Urjit Patel would have said probably no. He's probably said no. <laughs> <laughs> Urjit Patel was a no frill, you know, he's a no nonsense, no frill. Well meaning, understanding of uh, economy is fabulous and well meaning. As I said, he actually, what Rajan's unfinished agenda, he, he went, he completed it. So there's no question on his integrity, governance, and knowledge. Uh, but certain things um, he, would, he would probably. Probably for him, it's black and white, yes and no. So probably he would have said no. Subarao could have gone the Das's way in some way, forming a committee. Um, because um, um, there is one case when... That's Pano, a career bureaucrat way of uh, doing things. Yeah. But the RBI's history is, if you see, the Rajan and Rajan and Urjit Patel were the two different things. Uh, typically, the bureaucrats take over RBI. Uh, Subarao is one case which is a direct parachuting from the finance ministry. Otherwise, whether it's Reddy or Jalan, there's always a gap. You know, you from ministry, you go somewhere, or from uh, planning commission, you go somewhere. But you are a bureaucrat, you are coming. Subarao was the first case where direct parachuting from the thing and all. So Subara probably would have done. In fact, in one case, he did. Um, he did uh, like Pranam Mukherjee wanted to have a committee, and um, on basically about the supervisory committee where RBI and SEBI, all of them are there for a financial sector supervision, etc. And Subara had strong views, and he opposed it. Uh, so I would like to believe Subara would 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 have done probably similar thing, uh, which Das has done. One last one. So maybe you can talk a little bit about the Feb 12 circular, which was important for cleanup in the banking sector to some extent. So if instead of uh, Patel, at that time we had Jalan, how would, how would he have handled that? Definitely. Problem? Say again, that's, that's Patel, Feb 12, 2018. Now what's the circular for your audience? We must say that. No, the circular said that one day default. Is it? I'm, I'm, am I correct? You are talking about the same circular. That one day default, bank has to take step. I mean, there's no question you have to invoke IBC, that's insolvency and everything and all. And then I think Supreme Court stepped in and Supreme Court said, no, I mean, you can't do that. You have to give them time. And then RBI retweaked it uh, in a different way. But the spirit remained the same, that there is no escape if you are a default from IBC. Uh, no escape from insolvency. It's not one day, the longer rope is given. Now, this is typical uh, Urjit Patel. Urjit Patel was more aggressive than, uh, um, than Raghuram Rajan in cleaning up. Uh, Jalan would not have definitely done it. Okay, <laughs> Jalan would not have definitely done it. Jalan would have actually had a lot of consultation with the, with the banks in the beginning uh, and then would have sort of convinced them, look, I am the governor, you have to, uh, there's no escape from this, I have to do it, you tell me how is how needs to be done. And then you would find the golden means, which is a majjim way, that Buddhist philosophy, that in between, the middle path, probably would have done this. But the cleanup would have happened probably. Definitely, definitely. I would say Jalan and Das is, a, is, a, is the same, I would put them in the same category. Uh, is a, um, basically, um, uh, they want to do things the way they want to do. They would not. They would not uh, give up, but they will keep people the way uh, you know. They will keep people with them, 
and they will make them feel that they are a party to it you know that's joint kind of family <laughs> style <laughs> yeah yeah uh, while while um, raghuram rajan is a larger than life persona there's a different thing altogether subarao is brutally honest subarao is uh, you know he was a great learner in fact a lot of things quietly he did which you don't know like for instance rbi banglo there is no inventory you know you can buy anything and you can do anything etc etc because you are there for staying there for 3 years and 5 years you, but subarao for the first time he created an inventory that while he is entering what are the things what are the flowers what's the carpet everything else and then while leaving also making the tick mark so he very particular then he used to go to um, you know um, he used to like he was very curious to know the outside world while Uh, they are, he used to go to uh, all this uh, the i would say the financial inclusion you know to a different uh, regions he used to walk down and meet people so on and so forth so he is a very again very different kind of personality and but reddy is again you know reddy <laughs> who do it as a gundan uh, as i said and other part is this since we are talking about how one governor is different from other governor Uh, say jalan was a general physician you walk in jalan will probably take, check your blood pressure check your pulse and give you medicine i'm that economist pulse and this thing i'm talking about but uh, reddy was more a sort of specialized thing you know you will go for 3d echo he will go for mri scanning <laughs> and then he will find what needs to be done so that was a typical so the reason i'm asking these questions is also important because rajan instituted this clean up yeah but would any other governor at that point of time would we have seen like a similar formulation of policy or you think our trajectory would have been very different uh i would think that no that's a unique thing globally it's not happened i think rajan because of his international exposure and his he came with the missionary zeal to clean up clean up the thing and he wanted to make a mark of uh, this thing and all so he came like if you look at the most of the governors they came at a time like jalan came in a station crisis right um subarao came in um lehman crisis lehman crisis uh, current uh, person um, das covid not came in but later covid came and all uh, when rajan came in uh, that taper trend time and all Uh, so every governor most of the governors c- came in when there's a crisis looming large or already happened and all having said that i think uh, the kind of clean up which raghuram rajan initiated and uh, completed by urjit patel i would not uh, think any other governor would have done that way they would have persuaded banks they could have done it differently but doing this and take it or leave it we have to do that and uh, forcing you to as i said from belly dancing to strip cheese forcing you i mean that that was pretty pretty tough bankers were unhappy and at the same time he reached out to the government and convinced the government that 2 trillion plus uh, recap needs to be done had the recap not been granted by the government then the then this would have it is all interlinked so well he had his way at the same time he also he also in sync with the ecosystem and kept every person involved i mean those who matter involved and took whatever uh, needed from them so arun jetly involved and arun jetly uh, announced that in fact if you remember the this asset quality review also announced by the finance ministry not by reserve bank of india so that way you know he is also he, he did it he play, played it well in fact within reserve bank of india uh, among his deputy governors and all uh, there were differences of opinion they wanted to give a longer period for bank not six quarters six quarters is too short a period and of course there is very strong uh, opposition from the banking system but he went ahead so um, as you rightly said that the personalities are very important and they are very different from one one from another so we have talked a lot about rbi let's go to the other side the people we deal with every day the banks yeah so i see you have written two books on hdfc bank what makes it so special well yeah a lot of people asked me this question and um, there have been also tweets in social media how much money i made 
uh, meaning how much money from the bank I got. SDFC gave you. Yes. Uh, uh, I think a couple of tea, uh, because I'm not a coffee drinker. And uh, I think one's bada pav and one some kachuri samosa in their canteen. That's how I got. It's not a sponsored, it's not a sponsored um, uh, book at all. Uh, it's my book, it's a publisher's book. I mean, uh, first book, in fact, that was the initiate, initiation into my book writing when Jayco approached me to write a book on HDFC group. I approached Deepak Parekh uh, for HDFC. He said no. And then I, I, I took a look at HDFC bank and why, what excited me is uh, the bank was very different from others. Basically, it was a startup like in the 90s when it, it started as a startup. And each the banker were a sort of entrepreneur. You know, they left their high paying jobs, uh, bigger flats, bigger cars, settled for smaller flats, smaller cars, smaller salary. Uh, but each of and the foreign bankers they came, but each of them came with a mission that we'll build an institution and we will the ownership because the stock options etc will come and we will we'll make money. In fact, Aditya Puri, uh, there is a, at least one reference. Uh, wife of one banker was unwilling, was not at all happy that her husband would leave such a high paying job in a foreign bank and. Um, and join this uh, bank, which does not have any uh, kind of proper kind of chairs and tables. It was like a um, uh, railway station in the beginning, you know. And uh, Adityapuri convinced that lady. Said that the house you were staying, I think at Napier and C Road, you will own this house a few years down the line. You would not have to stay at a bank's house. It will be your own house. Let him join us. So here is a bunch of entrepreneurs. Actually, it's just a professional entrepreneur's first time. Because they say that if we can make a bank, we'll make our fortune. There's no, it's not ashamed of, you're not a charity. So that's how they started, which is quite fascinating. And then I find it's, it's slightly different. Uh, you know, here's a bank which understood that banking is more a business of liability than credit. You know, you have to keep your cost of liability down. Then only you can afford to have the AAA, so-called AAA rated uh, borrowers and still make money. Because what happens, normally what banks do, you know, I can't, they can't afford AAA rated borrower because if your, if your cost of money is 7 or 8%, percent, 7%, percent, then a AAA rated borrower at 8.5% you cannot give. In a normal circumstances, I am saying. So what do you go? You go for a lesser rated and then you earn for 12 or 13%, but then you risk your balance sheet. Right? Here he said, no, my cost, I'll bring it down to four, four and a half. And then I can afford to charge 7% or seven and a half and get triple rated borrowers. So if I have my liability strategy correct, then the other side will be automatically you know, fall in place. So HDFC Bank in the 90s when it started, the first thing if you look at, it attacked all the money flows, like dividend. Let it go through me. Stock market related, let it go through me. So the, the so-called float money, the free money for 24 hours, now it is coming down dramatically. Virtually there's no float. But I'm talking about nine, 90s when there was a seven day, 10 day, three day float money, free money. So I think the bank was different. A, the approaching the banking business, you know, stay away from large corporates, uh, uh, do your own due diligence, do your own underwriting and focus on liability. And treat yourself as an entrepreneur, not as a professional. That was the, my first book, Bank for the Buck. And um, then Finance Minister Chidambaram launched the book. And he said, uh, it's, a children, it's a child of liberalization, which is correctly so. And then, uh, again, um, sometime later, uh, I think 2017, 18, um, my same publisher approached me, look, HDFC has gone uh, ahead of others in terms of technology. And also, this bank is uh, completing its 25 years. The, again, it's a child of liberalization, set of new banks, and first, I mean, 25 years happening. There's a possibility of writing a book. Why don't you revisit and do that? So the second book is actually uh, sort of 
revised edition of the uh, under a new name new packaging and of course a lot of new things but basically the tech journey of again uh, the first bank to do that now of course uh, there are um, quite a few uh, banks uh, in the new private sector which is as good if not better than than hdfc so they have equally worthy stories I, to write yes about. of course of course definitely so the first book is the beginning and the second is like how they matured yes. into what they are today yes yes and again i repeat i had a couple of tea samosa and uh, what do you call it uh, bada pav etc so if i may so hdfc was your first book 2012 right correct and since then you have written six books seven books. seven books that's a seven so that's like one book a year how uh, do no, you one and a half yeah 16 one, months one and a half year yeah, yeah. yeah how yeah. do you do it i think it's a passion i mean you like something and these are all solo books but i do write a few chapters here and there uh, that also make uh, take time i think it's a it's a passion i mean um, in india uh, typically for a non fiction book writing you don't make money as such um, i mean you get royalty but uh, that's not what um, i'm not my book does not sell in millions not even in lakhs it sells in thousands so at the end of the day the check you get uh, it's it's if you see the you will see uh, you might say that oh, you are a fool why are you wasting your time but i think it's his passion i would love i would like to tell a story and um, and how do you do it like do you follow a process of writing the book because it takes a lot of patience and perseverance to write so many yeah it, it's a discipline the first book uh, yes i took uh, i took off uh, two months off from my uh, from my then employer um, and i i went to goa and i said you know <laughs> i just shut myself uh, this thing i i collected all the material but the writing part i did uh, the two months shutting me off from this uh, that's the first book uh, second from the second book onward it becomes a part of it i don't leave mumbai i am in my small study i do it i mean i i i mean typically i need to because i i am not a i'm not a full time writer so i'm i do multiple jobs like in the sense of advising a bank and then um being a consulting editor with business standard and then meeting investors and other things you know in various thing or other so it's not that maybe maybe not even one fourth maybe one sixth or one seventh of my working hours actually invested in books Uh, but it's a very disciplined approach say so at the end of the day if you love something you end up doing it no it's a love's labor so you <laughs> you don't feel it probably probably stress is there but you don't feel it if you love something then it happens no then you don't then you f- it it's a passion and love and of course a discipline uh, i don't know any formula it it just happens that's it perfect on that note uh, thank you so much for taking out time and yeah good luck with thank your you. new book thank you thanks